enjoying bipartisan engagement with its mission. Today, we will discuss and present the future of PEPFAR and our broader progress towards the sustainable development goal of ending the AIDS epidemic by 2030. I look forward to learning from all of our speakers today as we discuss this important topic. I am now delighted to introduce today's moderator, Peter Hayward. He is the founding editor-in-chief of The Lancet HIV and has served in this role since 2014. He hosts the podcasts, The Lancet HIV in conversation with, and speaks to the journal's authors to explore their research and its impact on people's health, health care, and health policy. He previously served as deputy editor of The Lancet Infectious Diseases. Over to you, Peter. Well, thank you, Dr. Hibbard, for that introduction. I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate this session today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the contributions of our fantastic panel. I really hope that everyone who's joined us today will enjoy the conversations that we're going to have. And I hope that you'll all feel free to participate by, by in the discussion later by asking questions of our panel by using the Q&A function in Zoom. It is first my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Ambassador John and Kengasong. Dr. Nkengasong is ambassador at large at the US Global AIDS Coordinator, sorry, the US Global AIDS Coordinator and senior bureau official for the Global Health Security and Diplomacy at the US Department of State's Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy. Dr. Nkengasong's role as a senior official includes leading the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. A leading virologist with over 30 years of experience in public health, Dr. Nkengasong has previously served as the Director of Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as the Branch Chief and Associate Director for Laboratory Science at the US CDC's Division of Global HIV and Tuberculosis International Laboratory, as Acting Director of the CDC Center for Global Health and Co-Chair of PEPFAR's Laboratory Technical Working Group. What a list of, uh, what a list there, incredible. Dr. Nkengasong is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and recognitions, and most recently, he served as one of the World Health Organization Director General Special Envoys for COVID-19. We, de we are delighted to be joined by Ambassador Nkengasong today, and I'll now turn things over to him. Ambassador Nkengasong. Can you hear me? Just testing. We can hear you now. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction and part as well. Thank both, both of you for your kind invitation to join this very important dialogue. Let me say that it's truly an honor to be with you on this dialogue because of someone who is so special and dear to me. I think I owe my presence here today in front of you because of that person, uh, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Greenberg hired me at CDC to join CDC in 1994. He interviewed me in 1994 and we are in 2024. So it's exactly 30 years ago that I first met him and he, he nurtured my first steps in transforming me from being a bench biologist to a public health uh, uh, expert and taught me the rules of CDC and the, the rigor of conducting public health. And today, I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm still a public health person, a policymaker or whatever, but be that what it is, I owe a lot of, of that to uh, Dr. Greenberg. So it's truly humbling to be in the presence of someone you consider as a giant and hero and mentor in, in your life. I know that he, knowing him, he'll be uh, terribly embarrassed and he didn't want me to say this, but I thought that uh, it's a unique moment uh, to, to say it uh, in, in public and in private. So in the next uh, couple of minutes, I will go through, uh, just share my reflections on PEPFAR's role in the global HIV AIDS uh, pandemic, the response, 
then, now, and, and the future. So to start off with, right, this is, I usually call paper, as I, the title suggests here, uh, let me take this up, this. I usually see paper in the lens of uh, inequity and equity. And as the title suggests here, paper is an inequity gap closer. This slide shows you where we were in 1996 timeline. The blue lines there shows you AIDS related deaths in the United States in the mid 90s when ARV became available and you see the sharp decrease in number of deaths. At the same time, uh, deaths continue to increase in Africa and over the period of between 1996 and 2006, almost, uh, almost 10 million uh, Africans died of, of HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS had created havoc in, in Africa at that time. And the graph you see here on your left-hand side shows the effect of, of HIV AIDS in, in terms of life expectancy that had decreased significantly in many African countries. In Zimbabwe, it had decreased about 35 years, 28 years in Botswana, and about 12 years in South Africa. And the GDPs in those countries had decreased by 2.6 2 percentage uh, uh, points. Then in January 2003, at the State of the Union address, President Bush announced PEPFAR. And I would urge that you read this. It says, to meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief a work of mercy beyond all current international efforts to help the people of Africa. And the last part of that is so profound. It says, seldom has history offered a greater opportunity to do so much to so many, President Bush. And the picture on the, the bottom panel here shows President Bush and at that time, Senator Biden, who was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee and just behind him, uh, Senator Kerry at that time, they have all served in different functions, and today we have President Biden continuing to uh, support uh, PEPFAR. Last year, as we celebrated the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR, there were so many editorials that were written, but one of those caught my attention. It was one that was written and published in the Hill by uh, former President of Botswana, uh, President Festus Muhad, and the former HHS Health and Human Services Department, uh, Tommy Thompson. And I urge that you read the, 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 the title here. It says, How PEPFAR Helped to Save Botswana from Extinction. How PEPFAR Helped to Save Botswana from Extinction. Over the years, over the last 21 years, because of PEPFAR, AIDS related deaths have declined by 68% since the peak in 2004. Because of PEPFAR, the rates of new infections have decreased by 42% across many countries in Africa. And 25 million lives have been saved, 5.5 million babies born free of HIV AIDS. At the same time, PEPFAR has had broad uh, impact in other areas. GDP per capita has increased by 2.1% in countries that have received PEPFAR support. Child mortality had decreased by, 20, by 35% in countries that PEPFA has supported, and girls and boys, the rates of girls and boys drop out of school had decreased by 9%, and immunization rates have increased by 10 percentage points. And this is uh, a study that was conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation. PEPFA has also strengthened health systems across the board, and we invest every year one point. $1 billion in supporting health system strengthening across the board. And this slide just shows you some of those areas that PEPFA has contributed significantly, including strengthening over 170,000 healthcare facilities. And I must say here that this infrastructure that you see here, the massive infrastructure in Africa is being used every day uh, when the need arises to respond to disease outbreaks, including the recent pandem uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic and cholera outbreaks in West, in West, Eastern and Southern Africa. This slide shows you progress, how countries have uh, progressed over the years. And it shows you in blue, the rates of new infection, incident rates, 
and in red, uh, the total deaths of HIV in population. And regardless of where you are in some of these countries that have the highest burden of HIV AIDS, you see that the blue line, which is the incident rate, had decreased significantly progressively and has crossed a line very recently around the 2020, 2022 timeline, and it's now currently below the rates of, of deaths. You see that uh, in other countries outside of Africa where PEPFAR is engaged in Cambodia, Nepal, and Thailand, the story is the same. Really, because of PEPFAR and other programs like Global Fund, the trajectory of HIV AIDS has been changed. However, the story is not uniform everywhere. We continue to see areas that will require aggressive acceleration efforts, like in Burma, where the two lines are not crossing. Just a reminder, the top line that you see there is the incident and the red is mortality in Indonesia and Laos. You also still have areas that we characterize as uh, epidemic of concerns in the, the Czech Republic, Tajikistan, Papua New Guinea and Philippines. And in Philippines and Papua New Guinea, you see that the rate of new infection has actually increased by 400 percentage over the last couple of years. So the fight against HIV is not over and HIV will not be defeated everywhere if it still continues to exist anywhere in the world. If we have to get to our 20, uh, uh, 25 goals, which is to achieve the 395, which is make sure that 95% of people who are infected know their status, 95% of those that know their status are linked into treatment, and 95% of those uh, have viral load suppression, we have a long way to go. It means between now and 2025, we need to find about 2 million people and put them on treatment. And that is the, 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 the blue line you see there, which is hitting the, the, the diamond. But if we continue to accelerate the way we are accelerating, we'll miss that target, which is the red line. That is what we're currently doing. So we need to accelerate as much as possible everywhere, especially in those countries that have not achieved the kind of progression or trajectory that I just showed you for Botswana, uh, Eswatini, and Namibia. How do we end HIV AIDS? We published a commentary in Nature just a few uh, months ago in November 28, to be very specific, where we said this is how the world finally ends HIV AIDS, but especially in Africa. We said we should prioritize young people specifically girls and young women aged 15 to 24 and men 24 to 25 to 35 because the rates of new infections is extraordinarily high in this group. Young people aged 15 to 24 account for 27% of new infections globally, but if you focus in Africa, they constitute about 60 to 65% of new infections. <clears throat> At the same time, in Eastern and Southern Africa, where the burden of HIV is the highest, uh, only 25% of girls and 17% of boys between the ages 15 to 19 underwent HIV testing in the past year. Why is that important? If you look at Tanzania, for example, and I ask that you focus only on the slide on your right-hand side, it shows you the results of a population-based survey that we've conducted just recently in 2022, and the results were just released. If you look at viral suppr suppression by sex, in uh, the age group 15 and 25 to 34, it tells you a story that the rate of suppression is just 54% around the age group 15 to, uh, to 24 years, and only about 76% amongst females, the age uh, 25 and 34. And if you look at the males in the corresponding age, especially between 25 and 34 years, it's only about 57%. And if you look at that age group, 35 to 44 years, among male is only 62%. So it tells you that we have to continue to work hard in bringing young uh, males into care, make sure that they receive their treatment and then they stay in, in treatment. Otherwise, the cycle of transmission will, will continue. Our ultimate goal is to get uh, to bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030. And a, a pathway to that is that by next year, end of next year, which it means we have about 20 months, we should bring as many countries as possible to the 395 goals. To do that, we need a very strong collaborative spirit between government, 
the civil society and partners. We have to act with respect, courage, and boldness. Boldness in the fact that uh, we have to set targets, ambitious targets, and have the courage to meet those targets and implement policy change that will address those targets. So in the next year, this year and next year, PEPFA will be championing a theme called Sustain and Accelerate. Sustaining the gains we have made over the last 20 years, but accelerating as much as, as possible. We have offered a five uh, uh, by three strategy, which says we have to focus on the five pillars that you see here, listed one to five, but then have three enablers, which is make sure community leads, we should be innovative and lead with data, we should lead with data so that we know exactly where to focus the limited resources. So there are certain lessons that we've learned over the last 21 years. First of all, is that political leadership matters if we truly have to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat. Let me just expand on that. And I've always used a formula which says good politics plus good public health equals life safe. And in a book published in 2015, Peter Piot, whom we all know very well, stated this. He says, science does little good when it operates independently of politics and economics. And politics is worthless if it rejects scientific evidence and respect for human rights. I think that was true then, it's true today. So in terms of politics, why does it matter? In the early 20s, we saw good politics in, in display. And it's thanks to this good politics that we were able to begin to bend the trajectory of HIV AIDS. In 2000, the UN Security Council adopted resolution 1308, which was the first resolution by the United Nations ever to characterize HIV AIDS as a threat for global security. In 2001, the UN General Assembly held a special session on HIV AIDS, the first ever by world leaders focusing on her. And in 2001, uh, thanks to Kofi Annan's leadership, the Global Fund was established and it has since raised about 60 billion and saved about 50 million lives across the three diseases, i.e. TB, malaria, and HIV. And this is President Bush, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan, the president of Nigeria, at that time, Olusugu Ubasanjo and General Colin Powell. That is the power of uh, good politics, where we apply them uniformly. Second is inno innovation and data-driven approaches. We have seen the power of innovation, where from the start of, in the mid 90s, as I showed earlier, uh, treatment of HIV was based on a cocktail of drugs. But because of good science and innovation, today we just require one peer. And we are now in the phase where it is very possible that in future we, we're moving towards injectable treatment. We already have injectable prevention, uh, pre preventive uh, 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 interventions. And just in the last couple of, of months, we as PEPFA has launched a, a program in six African countries to begin to implement long acting injectable HIV prevention drug, which will be, we hope, could be a game, a game changer. And this was just published in Science uh, a, a, few, a few days ago to be very specific on March uh, uh, 25th. We also know that our uh, PEPFAR is positioning itself to be that learning institution by looking at ways that we could bring AI, uh, machine learning into uh, uh, predictive borders that can help us identify and learn where HIV patients are at risk for failing treatment and viral load suppression. This is a study that was published in South Africa, not by us, but by South Africa. And that shows that it, uh, the power of applying machine learning and AI into HIV response uh, programs. Heart financing, as I move to my conclusion, remains a critical focus if we have to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat. This is an important slide and it shows you three colors here. In blue, it shows the out-of-pocket expenditure. This is general health financing, and you can deduce from this HIV, and I'll go to the next slide on that. But in orange, it shows you total government expenditures in countries, and then in green is total international expenditure. I mean, it clearly shows that if we have to bring HIV to an end, domestic financing will matter. It's sustained domestic financing will matter. For example, in 2020, uh, out-of-pocket expenditure was $168 billion. Domestic financing was 140 billion and international funding was 41 billion. So 
a bulk of the funding must come from the countries. And this slide shows you uh, over the years, right up to 2022, where HIV funding is coming from. The red bars indicate domestic funding and private sector funding. And the light uh, 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 bars, the red bars indicate United States funding. And you can see that PEPFAR funding has flat line over the years. And uh, the, the global fund funding is the, the dark red color. They're clearly showing that if we have to turn the ties against HIV AIDS in a very sustained manner, uh, having those dialogue with countries that we support using the leverage that we have to uh, unlock domestic financing and make sure that they are used appropriately is going to be important. Where do we go from here? To conclude, just last week, PEPFAR was reauthorized for one year, and this is a, 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 a write-up that was published by a Bipartisan Policy Center. It says uh, this is a notable step forward, but full bipartisan reauthorization is still needed. So at, on this note, we welcome the one-year reauthorization of PEPFAR, but we urge we we'll continue to work with Congress in a bipartisan way to ensure that we have a clean five-year reauthorization. And this is a tweet from the Senate Foreign Relations Chairperson, uh, uh, Senator uh, Cardin, who says, in quote, deeply disappointed by PEPFAR one-year reauthorization. PEPFAR, one of the most successful and bipartisan foreign assistance program in your nation's history, I'm deeply disappointed that the, tradition, the, the traditional five-year reauthorization wasn't secured in this year's appropriation package. We remain optimistic that it will be the case next year when PEPFAR in March comes up for renewal. PEPFAR continues to be a bipartisan program. I've engaged with several senators, Congress people over my two, close to two years uh, tenure in this position. And I'd like to thank the bipartisan nation the support that PEPFAR has enjoyed, including in arriving at this one year support that we just got. PEPFAR has enjoyed the support of 11 Congresses and four presidencies. If PEPFAR is reauthorized going forward, uh, this is what we project will happen. About 5.2 million AIDS-related deaths will be prevented. This will lead to 4 million fewer orphans due to HIV AIDS. It will lead to 6.4 million new HIV infections prevented, and this will result to 1 million fewer newly infections in children. So that is the power of this program, if it continues to be supported in a bipartisan manner. If we suddenly stop PEPFAR, what will happen in the high burden countries? And this is my last slide. You see an increase of about 400% in the number of deaths. This is the orange line in PEPFAR. So again, re reiterating that the gains we've made over the years are very fragile and we must continue to uh, sustain the, the response. It also shows that the rates of orphans will increase significantly because of that increased number of deaths. This is modeling that we just did recently and published uh, on the, the December 1st. So thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. And I really sincerely uh, um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be on this platform. Well, thank you, Ambassador and Kang Song. I think that was a fantastic overview and it's really, Great to see not only the direct benefits that PEPFAR has for people living with HIV or at risk of HIV, but also the off-target effects and benefits um, that have really, you know, have made a massive difference to people in countries that have benefited from Pe PEPFAR support. So thank you. I'd now like to take, take a moment to introduce the rest of the speakers that are going to be uh, speaking in our program today. First, we're going to hear from Susan Kuubin who is the director of the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research. Dr. Kuiven also serves as professor of obstetrics and gynecology and medicine at the Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University and pro professor of health services, policy and practice at the School of Public Health. Then we are going to hear from Alan E. Greenberg, who is the director of the District of Columbia Center for AIDS Research. He's a professor in the Department of Epidemiology in George Washington Milken Institute School of Public Health and a professor of medicine, and microbiology, immuno immunology and tropical medicine in the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And finally, we will hear from Rene Heffron, an HIV prevention researcher with doctoral training in clinical epidemiology and an expanded methodological toolkit that incorporates implementation science, 
behavioral science and qualitative research. Dr. Heffron serves as a professor of medicine and director of the Center of AIDS Research at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She leads numerous research projects that address consequential questions about HIV prevention with colleagues in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. So first, Dr. Q. Uven, over to you. Can you see my slides? We can, yes. Okay, uh, so I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. And uh, I wanna thank the ambassador for giving a very, very great summary of how important the PEPFAR is to all of us. And I'm going to focus more on how the future of BEPFAR affects uh, our Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research. The Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research is a collaboration between Brown University, its affiliated hospitals, Lifespan, and Boston University and Boston University Medical Center. So if you look at all the PEPFAR countries that have been uh, mentioned, we are CIFAR work in Kenya, in South Africa, in Uganda, Ukraine, India, Philippines, and in Brazil. So we do work a lot of our collaborating PEPFAR countries. And I can tell you without PEPFAR support, for infrastructure, for clinical, um, for the clinics, and for the staff, none of this would have been possible. I know these are busy slides, but this you don't have to read all of this. I just wanted to give you an overview of all our current programs from our CIFAR that are currently funded working uh, on HIV care cascade, HIV prevention, looking at comorbidities, and cancer related to HIV in Kenya. We have two training grants, one for the prevention of HIV-related cancer in HIV-infected women, and also a partnership with Moy University on biostatistics training on HIV. We have big data and AI in decision making, as the ambassador said, the use of AI starting and how do we help using AI in HIV care cascade. Uh, we are doing a lot of resistance work, resistance failure, and what would be the second line of choice uh, in terms of antiretrovirals for those who are failing. Uh, we work mainly also with perinatally infected Kenyan children and adolescents because they have been most exposed to different kinds of antiretrovirals. And it's a very difficult population to deal with in terms of adherence and have a higher risk probably of developing HIV resistance. We also are working with the community and microfinance groups the ambassador mentioned about financing. And sometimes we can rely on the government, we can rely on donors, but occasionally we also have to strengthen the community in terms of relying on their own financial resources to address their HIV needs. In terms of uh, prevention of cervical cancer, I'd like to tell you a short story that we have a Fogarty training grant and we train several of our obstetrician gynecologists as Fogarty scholars. And in 2009, when I went to Kenya, there was no established cervical cancer screening program. And we know that HIV, uh, women with HIV are more at risk for developing cervical 
dysplasia or neoplasia and eventually cervical cancer because they are more at risk for human papillomavirus infection and persistence of human papillomavirus infection based on their immunological deficits. Uh, we started with a small Fogarty grant to test 150 HIV-infected women through visual inspection with acetic acid and pap smear. Why did we choose visual inspection with acetic acid? Because it is can be done by nurses and midwives. It costs 20 cents. And pap smears need a laboratory infrastructure and cytotechnologies. And it costs at that time about $9, which is unaffordable for many of our patients. With that small study, we showed that 40% of women who have HIV have cervical abnormalities. And this was at the time when there was no massive spread of antiretroviral therapy. Since that time, from one side, we have uh, spread to about 10 sites. And when we look at our data last month, we have screened over 180,000 women, both HIV with and without HIV. So we are now looking at the effects of treatment and looking at more uh, pathogenesis issues and so why some women develop cancer and why some women don't develop cancer. So uh, we also have work in emergency rooms where there are persons at risk who don't meet the healthcare system unless they are in an emergency situation and have increased the testing rates for HIV in the emergency situation from 23% to over 70%. And some innovative work on mobile phone-based screening for HIV and anemia in young children that are exposed to HIV. In South Africa, it's mainly, part of the work is mainly on HIV and TB. We have a lot of researchers working at the intersection of HIV and TB, transmission of drug-resistant TB. Um, we have work on pre-exposure prophylaxis, particularly in women who are pregnant and postpartum women. We are looking at the uh, um, evidence-based translation behavioral therapy in terms of HIV treatment outcomes among women who are intimate who are undergoing intimate partner violence. We're looking at migration and HIV outcomes. We're looking at cardiometabolic health among HIV exposed and unexposed children who are the majority now of the women uh, of the children being born because as the ambassador said, one of the biggest successes, in implementing HIV therapy to pregnant women is even in Africa, we have decreased mother to child transmission to less than 2% if they are taking their antiretroviral medications. But many of these children who don't have HIV have been exposed to HIV. We also have a work, a work working with students and teachers and in adolescents to prevent HIV transmission. As the ambassador pointed out, in Africa, young women are very high risk and have a high prevalence and incidence of HIV infection. So I am very grateful to the ambassador for bringing out the issue about the Philippines. The Philippines was one of our HIV training sites in the 1990s. But because there was a very low prevalence and incidence of HIV, despite the fact that the neighboring Southeast Asian countries like Thailand and Cambodia had higher rates and incidence and prevalence of HIV, the Philippines remained below 1,000 year after year. And so the Fogarty International Center told us, we probably should stop our work in the Philippines. 
And we did stop our work in the Philippines. But as you can see, it's now estimated that the HIV incidence globally is going to come down. But in the Philippines, uh, it's projected to go up. And from less than 1,000, the 2023 numbers now that there are over 160,000 people with HIV in the Philippines. And each year, you can see the incidence going higher. I think 2020 was an aberration because of the COVID pandemic where testing was less. But it's mainly also in men who have sex with men and cisgender women. Uh, so this is, we have a training grant led by Donna Perario and myself. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Aparario has moved to Emory University, but we will continue our work with the Philippines. So all the work that we have done in the Philippines really have centered on men who have sex with men and transgender women trying to understand their vulnerabilities, uptake of preventive services, intake of antiretroviral therapy, Ad adherence to medication, availability of services, but also characterizing how much stigma they have to undergo and the overlap between substance use and sexual risk for this population. In Uganda, much of our work is on HIV, alcohol abuse, and HIV and TB. Dr. Samet has the International Uganda Boston Alcohol Network for Alcohol Research on HIV and AIDS. It's a PO1, it's work with Embarara Regional Referral Hospital, Embarara City Health Clinics, looking at the impact of alcohol use on TB disease continuum among people with HIV and testing the effect of gabapentin on improving HIV suppression via alcohol use uh, reduction. Uh, there is a new funded grant on TB, HIV, and aging in Uganda with Boston University. And we're looking very much forward into uh, looking at the issues of multiple infections and frailty among the aging population. Because like the US, with lessened mortality because of antiretroviral therapy, uh, even in Africa, patients with HIV are living longer and reaching an age where we did not expect anybody to be growing so old. My oldest patient in my own clinic is 86 years old. When I started HIV work in the late 80s, I never thought any patient of mine would live to their 80s. Uh, in India, Brazil, Ukraine, Dominican Republic, we also work on the HIV air cascade. We work on nutrition, um, HIV transmission networks and clustering, HIV drug resistance, and HIV TB. Despite the fact that there is a war in Ukraine, I must honestly tell you that we have been able to continue our work in Ukraine. Unfortunately, our work with Russia has stopped. Um, I hope that this will not be permanent, but the work in Ukraine because of the, uh, because of our great collaborators, this has not stopped. I don't know how they do it. They have been able to enroll and follow up their patients. And this is a testament to really the dedication of staff researchers and the infrastructure that PrepFAR has put in, even in countries where war is ongoing. So in summary, I would just like to say that without the support of PEPFAR countries, where our CIFAR is collaborating institution, we would lose the opportunity to continue our work in improving and understanding the HIV care cascade, 
elimination of HIV, pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis, STI treatment like the doxyprep and doxypep, understanding HIV resistance and second-line therapy, our work on HIV and comorbidities, both communicable and non-communicable diseases, cancer, and our work on improving mental health, HIV and TB, which go together in many, many countries, understanding social behavioral factors to improve HIV care, prevention, and retention, and reaching vulnerable populations, LGBTQ, uh, patients with intimate partner violence, children and adolescents, economically disadvantaged populations, rural populations, patients with mental health issues, immigrants, populations with human insecurity, nutritional insecurity. And so I cannot thank the PEPFAR program enough. I am disheartened that it has only been extended for a year, but I am sure the ambassador and all the people who are in leadership know the importance of PEPFAR and will continue all our work and the collaborations between PEPFAR and the CFAR. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Q. Uvin. That was a really uh, fantastic presentation, just showing that, I mean, I'm gobsmacked by the global extent of uh, the activities you're involved in. I think it was a really uh, great overview and insight into um, some of the PEPFAR supportive work um, goes on. So thank you. Um, I would just like to remind everyone listening to the session today, um, watching the session today, please do um, join in the conversation by adding your questions to the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, looking forward to an exciting and interesting Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, but for now, I'd like to hand over to Alan Greenberg for the next presentation. Alan. Thank you. Sharing slides here. I'd like to uh, thank you, quickly thank the um, our hosts, the BU School of Public Health for the invitation today, Peter, for your kind introduction, and especially Dr. Nkega Song, Ambassador Nkega Song, for your very kind words and for your leadership of the absolutely vital PEPFAR program. Um, my remarks will be somewhat brief. Um, I'm flanked by some of the country and world experts in uh, global HIV today, and uh, um, our, our portfolio is, is, is more modest. Um, but I'll, uh, it's an honor to be able to present it today. So I, I'm the director of the DC Center for AIDS Research, and our mission is really focused on the HIV epidemic in DC. Um, as many people know, DC had one of the um, uh, more profound urban HIV epidemics in the United States, and, and most of our focus has been locally. Um, ha however, we have nine partners, and it, obviously, I work at the George Washington University, but people are from many different institutions who, who are in Washington, and especially American University in the last five years or so, there's a School of International um, Service, and, and Shannon Hader, Dr. Hader, many of you know, is the dean of the school. And in our own school, of um, in George Washington School of Public Health, both in the Global Health Department and the Prevention and Community Health Department especially, um, there's an emerging number of investigators who've been working on um, HIV um, in, in, in PEPFAR countries. I, I, we, we have 260 members, as you can see on the bottom, uh, about two thirds of whom are, are fairly well engaged in the CFAR, but we only have a handful or two of, of, of investigators who are actively working in PEPFAR countries. So it's a, it's a reasonably small um, portion of our, our portfolio. Um, and, and a lot of the focus has been on prevention and social science. It was really fascinating to see um, Dr. Q. Uvin's presentation and um, the, 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 the spectrum from uh, clinical work to laboratory work to um, prevention work. But I think, as you'll see, most of the um, investigators who work um, in Sub-Saharan Africa for, um, 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 for DC-based institutions are working in uh, our, our, our social and behavioral scientists. And, and so um, we have three from AU and three, uh, I think three from GW here, but you can see 
Um, we're working in Tanzania, Dominican Republic, South Africa, and, and there's, like there's an overlap with some of Dr. Q. Yubin's presentation, um, there, there are several studies, um, one in Tanzania and one, um, uh, one in um, um, South Africa, where, including Dr. Ko, who, who came from uh, um, Brown University last year to Washington, D.C., who work on interpersonal violence. There's a cell HIV self-testing project um, vulnerable, there's a stigma um, investigation, another stigma investigation, um, and, and a very fascinating intervention where um, youth are being employed to help provide care to persons aging with, aging with HIV in, in, in Southern Africa. So, um, and, and there's a new project that, so a, a K award, a training award that was funded from one of our women war, Walker colleagues working on transgender women in Ecuador. Um, so th this it's a very compared to um, I, I, what Dr. Q. Yuvin presented a, a more modest portfolio, but it, it, many of these are recent grants, and um, it's good to see that investigators are engaged. Um, we also, as 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 everyone knows, we give out pilot awards, and for, for a while between 2016 and 2021, there was a lot of interest in um, in in HIV in PEPFAR countries, and especially I think. Um, as you saw in the previous slide, two of these investigators, Dr. Ngadi and Dr. Robinson, were able to get pilot awards and then publish their data and then um, were successful at competing for NIH awards. Um, but in the last couple of years since the pandemic, we really haven't had a lot of um, applications for, um, for international work, and we're hoping that will change in, in the years ahead. Uh, and another thing our, our leadership noted that I think they wanted me to point out was um, it's been very interesting in the last couple, the last year or so, we've had three different applications where um, where people have been funded either through the CFAR or through the NIH through supplemental applications, where investigators are adapting global interventions and bringing them to Washington D.C. So, in fact, a lot of the um, expertise and lessons learned are being um, applied now locally in, in in our community. And and one is. Um, um, a peer-to-peer -peer mentor program for postpartum women living with HIV in DC. Um, where they're adapting a, a mother mentor mentor program from the United Kingdom. Um, there's a community-based organization about PrEP um, that was adapted from research that this investigator had been engaged in in Tanzania. And there's a, 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 a group intervention um, intervention for um, stigma that was was um, tested and 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 shown to be helpful in. Um, in Nigeria that is now being applied in Washington, D.C. So I think we thought that was interesting, that um, lessons learned through the local, global context are being applied to our local context. So again, I'll keep my comments short. We have a small but emerging portfolio of global HIV research, largely in, by prevention and behavioral scientists, um, by NIH-funded investigators. The countries we're working with, some overlap with Dr. Q. Yuvin, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, South Africa, Ecuador, and DR. Um, research in multiple key populations, as you can see, um, adolescent girls and boys, sexual minority men, transgender women, um, female sex workers, pregnant women, um, at-risk adults, and persons aging with HIV. And as I stated of note, there are several investigators who are adapting interventions from the global context and applying that expertise to DC. So uh, that's a, just a, a brief overview of what's happening in Washington, and I, I yield my time to uh, my uh, expert colleagues from the other sequels. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Greenberg. Uh, that was really a, a nice presentation and very interesting to hear about how um, efforts, uh, you know, PEPFAR supported efforts uh, are also contributing to programs uh, in the USA. Um, again, I'd like to remind you all to uh, add your questions to the Q&A function on Zoom. And uh, we'll now go over to our uh, final speaker, uh, Renee Hathorn. Over to you. Thanks so much. It's it's really a pleasure to be here today um, on behalf of the UAB Center for AIDS Research. Um, I I'm going to start with just a, a slide to tell you a little bit about our Center for AIDS Research. But I I think as you're seeing from the presentations by my colleagues, the Centers for AIDS Research are that are supported by NIH are really here to um, support research. And so um, it was you know, wonderful for Ambassador Nkengasong to show us that 
following the research is really foundational to the PEPFAR structure of programs and implementation strategies. And so we're here to um, fill in gaps, address unanswered questions, um, and really move the needle forward on ways to advance um, and really the curb, the curbing of the HIV epidemic. When I took the role of CIFAR director at the University of Alabama in Birmingham um, about two years ago, Dr. Greenberg said to me, you know, if you know one CIFAR, you know one CIFAR. And so our, our three presentations are all slightly different today. And what I wanted to do with my, my time with you was to talk a little bit um, broadly about the HIV epidemic, uh, where um, what, what I think we heard from Dr. Nkengosong are the priorities for PEPFAR over the next few years to meet the, um, the goal, the strategic goals, um, and then intersections with the UAB CIFAR in particular, just as some examples. Um, and also I wanted to just start by saying that I started my, sort of my first real job um, was in 2005 with the Centers for Disease Control in Zambia. And so if you were following the timeline of PEPFAR, it was right at the time where um, PEPFAR had been announced and it had been about a year, almost two years. And so systems were flowing and things were really getting underway. And it was a, a busy and an exciting time to spend three and a half years in Zambia um, participating in the rollout in the early days of PEPFAR. And since then, either directly myself through different roles or indirectly um, through partners and friends, um, I've been involved in, in, in PEPFAR and seeing um, its impact and watching things unfold. So it's very exciting to be here. So the Center for AIDS Research at the University of Alabama, on, our, on the left of this slide, you can see this is a, just a figure showing our structure. We're composed of five service cores, as we call them, and then two um, strategic, uh, scientific working groups, and one on substance use and one on global health reciprocal innovation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I also would be remiss if I didn't just point out that um, we are located you know, in the deep south of the US, and the figure on the right just shows you um, HIV prevalence around the US. And so we are located in one of the most highly burdened locations um, in the country. And we have a laser focus on, um, on HIV in Alabama and in the near region. Um, but then we also have an expansive focus and a long history of, of working globally. So in terms of priorities for the HIV epidemic in general, I think you know, there are sort of three main things in terms of implementing um, programs. And the first thing is to support virally suppressed people. And the second is to reduce gaps in viral suppression. And then the third is to expand access to PrEP as primary prevention. And these aren't necessarily in ranked order, but just three ways of putting these things together. And in terms of supporting virally suppressed people, this, this means you know, thinking about the, about the long game and how do you support people who are living with a chronic infection. And this means supporting services for comorbidities. So mental health, substance use, quality of life, co-infection with other STIs, hepatitis, um, and other infections. And if you, I'm not gonna show you a long list of grants and research that people at the UABC for are working on, but there, there are, all of these topics are, are covered and looking at innovative um, solutions and understanding in some cases about virology and, and immunologic outcomes so that we can find solutions and better support people as they advance into um, older age living with HIV. The next is to reduce gaps in viral suppression. And Dr. Nkengasong referenced this by talking about the high hanging fruit. I sort of uh, think about this also as needing to adopt in some settings and contexts, needing to adopt almost a mindset of eradication where we've reached you know, more than 95% of people who are diagnosed and know their status being virally suppressed. We've got we've to do more and really understand and reach um, in places that are where it's not as high as 95%, but then also keep striving. And when we, we adopt this mentality, it means we're gonna need to be, um, look at individual needs and really target approaches. These are data that just were presented at, at um, CROI, the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections a few weeks ago by uh, one of our CIFAR members, Dr. Adi Arana, who was the protocol chair for the latitude study. And these results were very exciting, um, working with people 
with HIV who are not suppressed, um, either lost to follow up or having poor viral response to their antiretroviral regimen, um, and showing that an in injectable cavitegravir repliverine regimen was superior um, in terms of uh, virologic failure and treatment related failure to the standard of care oral medications. And so, you know, really hoping uh, we'll see, we're going to see changes in guidelines in the US. I mean, really hoping we can see this um, injection roll out to people with HIV um, through, through PEPFAR and through and globally. I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that in Alabama, our viral suppression rate hovers around 63%. And depending on which region in the state you're, you're at, it's you know, a little higher or a little bit lower. And I wanted to bring up in this, in this instance, this um, idea of global health reciprocal innovation. And Dr. Greenberg mentioned this just a few minutes ago, but it's really this I idea um, that the NIH and others are, are really taken seriously and moving forward about leveraging what we've learned from other settings um, and, and, and adopting them elsewhere. And I think in, in terms of reaching um, the, the high hanging fruit or reaching those who are not yet virally suppressed, there's a lot we can learn from countries that have reached that 95%. Um, and, and we can try out either through research protocols or programmatic kinds of evaluations, um, newer strategies so that we can go deeper and increase viral suppression. And then the third thing is about expanding access to PrEP as primary prevention. And my career thus far has been really focused on PrEP. And I, I could say I could say a lot, um, but I'm just going to keep my comments few. And I think it's very exciting that we have three methods that have shown um, efficacy and that are part of national guidelines in many countries. I really um, am excited for the near future when I think and when I hope and think we will truly see a toolbox of methods for people so that it's not just um, a daily oral pill as the only option, but um, during you know, certain seasons of risk or partnerships, an injectable might be better or a vaginal ring might be better for some people and in some times. And I'm um, very excited to see this roll out and also to be able to conduct research looking at ways to optimize multiple product uh, PrEP programs. At the UAB CIFAR, the one, one of the things that's a thread through all of the PrEP research that's ongoing is putting community at the center. And um, we are constantly uh, in collaboration and in coordination with our community partners. We have a, tried to have a very broad definition and an inclusive definition of what community means. And many times it's, it's community-based organizations or aid service organizations, but also extending that to our public health departments, um, other academic research partners, and our Ryan White funded HIV clinics. And um, is building and, and really strengthening relationships with each of these so that we can talk about the community needs and priorities and how to center those in the research that we're doing. So I think I'll just end back with this slide. I think there's tremendous opportunities going forward for PEPFAR and the Centers for AIDS Research to um, be working on ways to, to impact programs and impact of the, of the programs to support people who are already virally suppressed, um, people who are not yet maybe di diagnosed or, and not yet virally suppressed, and then also to expand access to PrEP as primary prevention. And so I'll just thank you for, um, inviting me to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, Renee. And um, yeah, so we've got some questions coming in, and I've got a few questions of my own. would like to encourage anyone else, uh, anyone listening, if you've got any questions for any of our panelists, do, um, do please put them in the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, but actually, I'm going to start with a question that has come in for um, Ambassador and Kengasong. Um, and this was a question from, um, from Carmen Porn from Politico. And the question is, um, are you worried that PEPFAR is losing bipartisan support, given it, that it was only reauthorized for one year, and at least one of its main champions won't be a member of Congress next year? when it will come up for reauthorization again. 
So th th thank you, uh, Peter. Let me uh, say this and, and, and take it for a, a, a very um, honest answer. I think over the last one year that I've been working on the reauthorization, I've seen nothing other than a very strong bipartisan support for PEPFAR. I've been to um, a, a, a congressional uh, delegation uh, visit in South Africa with uh, Congress people and, and senators from both sides, and there's nothing but strong support in the field. Uh, just recently, about two, three weeks ago, I was in Cape Town with about 18 Congress people with uh, six senators, very strong bipartisan support. So I will not interpret this one year as uh, any, uh, as a collapse in that bipartisanship, but rather that some um, inaccurate information was provided uh, uh, since April and it led to a derailment of the, of the process. I remain optimistic that between now and March, we'll continue to engage Congress and educate people because uh, remember that uh, the statistics suggest that only about 10% of the people serving in Congress now were there 21 years ago when PEPFARM uh, started. So we need to really go back in there and do a whole educational access process to show, to educate what PEPFAR is and, and what it's doing, the impact, the remarkable impact. Just to end on a light note, uh, two years ago when I, 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 I met with President Bush in September of 2022, uh, and uh, he, he joked, he said, Ambassador, uh, uh, people don't, most people now don't know what PEPFAR is. If you, if you say PEPFAR, the thing is toothpaste. <laughs> so so that, that was a light mode, but that was very factual. That I mean, uh, 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 we need to educate more. We need to inform more. We need to engage more with, with, with Congress to make sure that uh, they, 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 they understand the power of PEPFAR, this, the life-saving uh, ability of PEPFAR that, in my view, is the, the greatest act in our humanity uh, since, uh, I, I, I would say, in, in this century, in the fight against infectious diseases. Well, thank you very much for that answer. And I think actually maybe I'd like to um, throw this open to the other panelists at this point, actually, and say, um, if you could make one point as a case for continued support of PEPFAR, um, what would you say to convince those people in power that PEPFAR is really worth the investment? And perhaps I'll come to you each in turn in the in the order that you presented. So, so Susan, I, I wonder what you would say. Susan? Are you, did you hear the question, uh, Dr. Kuryuvin? Oh, I, you're muted. Oh, I'm on mute. Sorry. Can you <laughs> just repeat the question? I mean, sorry. Yeah. So, following on from. I um, was like on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, yeah, so easily done. Um, following on from uh, uh, Ambassador and Kangasong's remarks there, um, I was wondering uh, what one point would you make? I know, you know, this is a bit reductionist, but what one point would you make to. Uh, Two people who are, uh, you know, who are in charge of reauthorizing and refunding PEPFAR. What one point would you make to them to convince them of the the value of continued support for PEPFAR? I think, aside from the big reduction in AIDS infections and mortality and the building of infrastructure training of healthcare providers, including the community. PEPFAR, although intended primarily for HIV care, has expanded beyond HIV. I think that it has become the pillar of really public health, non-communicable diseases. I think we are concentrating on HIV, but because we have improved HIV, it has become really the pillar and the infrastructure for public health in many, many countries. So when we look at the number of people saved, like we say it saved 25 million people, it decreased 
increase mother to child transmission, we are only looking at the tip of the iceberg of what PEPFAR has really done to the world. I think it's beyond HIV. It is one of the biggest investments that really has transformed care in many countries. Without PEPFAR, I think we would have had more deaths with many, many other diseases aside from HIV, and there would have been no infrastructure or trained healthcare providers and community workers. And the advocacy alone, I think it mobilized people who were not thinking that they were part of a healthcare system. It mobilized communities. It gave voice to underrepresented or marginalized population. I remember when HIV AIDS was just started, it's one of those diseases without the activist. I don't think we would have progressed that far. And I think PEPFAR has been the pillar of many of those things that we call value added, I think they're beyond value added. So that's what I think. Great, thank you. Um, and then Alan, if I could come to you for your thoughts. Sure, thank you, Peter, I'll be brief. Uh, I think it's a combination of um, looking carefully at the incredibly compelling data that Ambassador Kangasan presented. Um, you know, we're talking about saving millions of lives and 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 the other half of that is um what i think it was bill fagey who was one of the former dr fagey directors of cdc once taught us when we were younger about the importance of seeing faces beyond the numbers i mean a million millions of people is a lot of people and if you lined up the impact of you know just the human beings the children the families the mothers the fathers who've been affected by the PEPFAR program and made that human, put the human face on it. It really is a staggering contribution to humanity. Thank you. Thank you. And Renee? Sure, I'm probably just amplifying a bit what um, my colleagues have said, but um, I think Dr. Nhingasong's slide about um, health systems strengthening was tremendous and starting to put some of the data um, in, uh, in addition to the really direct HIV related data. Um, into focus. And I, I think that's hugely powerful. And I also wanted to just amplify what Dr. Kuruman was saying about the systems and the structures that are built for HIV, but really broad reaching. Um, you know, we were living in Lesotho when the COVID pandemic hit and our, you know, the folks on the front lines of doing HIV testing and HIV care became the folks on the front lines of COVID testing um, and COVID identification and those things because the systems and those are the systems and structures that were there. And I think that's a tremendous example of the, the size of the infrastructure and the power of the infrastructure and how it can be leveraged for other things. Great, thank you all for that. Um, so I'm just looking at, through at uh, some of the other questions that have come through, and I would again encourage anyone watching to add their questions to the Q&A if they've got them. Um, so there's a question here from uh, Gwyn Pollard from Monix International, who's wondering, who wonders how the panelists anticipate uh, USA's localization strategy impacting the way that PEPFAR programs are implemented in the coming years, especially since PEPFAR is a leader in terms of investing in local partners. How might a focus on localization encourage or discourage further investment from local financing sources that, as the ambassador mentioned, are critical to the long-term success of PEPFAR-initiated interventions? Um, maybe uh, Ambassador and Kengasong, you could speak to that at first and we then give the others an opportunity to chime in. No, sure, absolutely, Peter. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answer short here. Uh, we know that PEPFAR, uh, has strengthened government systems tremendously. PEPFAR has continued to strengthen local capacity that is not just government, but other uh, local organizations, national organizations. As we speak about 366 uh, national or local partners benefit directly from uh, uh, PEPFAR uh, funding to sustain the program. I think that is very important because we know that if we, uh, 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 that PEPFAR would not be there forever. 
and that we, if we really truly need to sustain the gains, which we must sustain the gains we've made, uh, we have to invest in national systems so that it can carry it and maintain it uh, for, for the longest. That is what uh, uh, localization is, is all about. It's not about um, uh, local versus international partners. It's about how do you build that local capacity? And nobody argues with that. I mean, everybody wants to see that in Lesotho, just to use uh, uh, Renee's uh, example, that they have government capacities that function well, that they have uh, local NGOs that can carry, continue to do their job, that they have some other uh, private sector that can do that. That's what we all want, right? That is what we mean by uh, bridging the gaps in inequity in global health. So I think um, uh, localization is part of that uh, sustainability agenda, which has to be defined in three lenses. We have to continue to make sure that political leadership matters, both in partner countries that we work and here in the city that uh, 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 we are in, uh, Washington DC and other capital cities that global health matters. Global health is part of global health security and part of uh, 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 universal health coverage. Second is that we have to make sure that localization speaks to the program needs because localization is, uh, is not an outcome. It should be a process for helping us to achieve the outcome. The outcome here is bringing HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat and maintaining it, the quality of life of people are, are, are affected and infected for throughout their lifespan so that they continue to be productive. And localization also means financial, uh, 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 financial uh, has financial implications, which as I showed on the slide, we see that a lot of financing for these health programs comes from the domestic uh, uh, side of the, of the house. So how do we make sure that the government of Lesotho also begins to fund uh, uh, NGOs, civil society that build the, cap the right capacity to help them in their response so that localization is not just about PEPFAS supporting local partners and national partners. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, would any of the other panelists like to speak to that? I mean, maybe not. I think uh, Ambassador Nkangason gave a, a pretty full and thorough answer there. Um, I, I can tell you that from our experience, you know, I think every, every donation is towards sustainability of the countries. I don't think that... It, the countries are expecting a dole out forever. But the presence of PEPFAR gave them at least an edge to reach where they can start moving in their own direction. I think that if you decimated the youth, the younger people, let's take Africa, and they were dying, and this life expectancy was minus 35 years, minus 25 years, without the help from PEPFAR to start with, the GDP, the workers, the number of people that can bring up a country, we would be at a very big disadvantage. I mean, in Kenya, we have a small example. When we brought antiretroviral therapy, of course, our patients had the Lazarus effect. They started becoming very healthy. Then we realized there was food insecurity. They were living, but because they haven't been able to work their farms or they haven't been able to have a job, it wasn't that easy. So a philanthropist uh, donated land and our HIV uh, infected patients started farming the land. Then they distributed the harvest among all of them. And then it became so successful, there was extra harvest after distributing it to all the patients that had HIV. They opened a restaurant. And every time I go there, we eat, you know, the nurses, the doctors, the the healthcare workers eat in the restaurant from the harvest, and now they're selling the extra harvest. So I think these are small, very, very small stories, but this is really where it starts. 
when we started the cervical cancer program, I had to go to the market to buy the pail, the cotton swabs, everything. And now at Moy University, we have a cancer center donated by uh, Eli Lilly and some uh, millionaire philanthropists from Kenya. Why? Because there was HIV and cervical cancer, HIV and KS, and now there's treatment for leukemia and all, the, all other kinds of cancers. And this is now a public-private partnership. It just needs a nudge. I think sometimes we, we don't know where to begin and some visionary gives us this little nudge and from there it snowballs. People want to be independent. Nobody wants to be a beggar. I don't think everybody has pride. I don't think there's any country, no matter how poor you are, that want, don't want to be sustainable and not be dependent on somebody always dictating how their country should be governed or, or how it should move forward. I think some people just need help. And that is how I see PEPFA. Great, thank you. And uh, would anyone else like to say anything on, to this point? No? Okay then, so um, I'd just like to then actually just come to a couple of really, uh, there's sort of a, a specific couple of questions relating to other other comorbidities um, and PEPFAR's involvement in the, in the Q&A that I just thought we could address quickly. And I'm, you know, you might have to sort of wave at me or just come off mute and give the answer um, if you have something to say to this. So you've had questions relating to whether their PEPFAR is um, doing any work in uh, viral hepatitis and also oral health uh, has been mentioned. Um, could anyone speak to that? Renee? Yeah, I can start. I mean, I, I know that NIH is very interested in both of these and they have released recent RFAs um, specific to both of those things, oral health and people with HIV um, and also um, hepatitis B, um, disease progression and treatment um, in people with HIV. So it's it's definitely um, at the as a priority for NIH and for HIV researchers that are part of our CFARS. As are as are all the, the comorbidities that I mentioned. I mean, mental health, you know, for sure, um, quality of life, all, all of those things are um, research priorities. I just want to add that we have a new scientific working group on HIV and oral health. And we have gotten several grants on that. So I think uh, it is really something that we are looking forward. We, uh, we are able to partner with the BU Dental School and uh, that's a big area that we would like to start to be more involved in. Right, well, watch this space then. Um, thank you very much for the contribution there. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then um, one thing that's actually come up a couple of times in, in the discussion is obviously the fantastic benefits of PEPFAR and the, the amazing results that's happened. And, you know, the, I wonder if um, anyone would like to be like to talk about the challenges that an aging population of people living with HIV presents um, and how and sort of what your experiences in your work, you know, might tell us about how we need to prepare for that globally. Um, perhaps, um, Alan, would you like to um, talk to that first? Sure. You know, I think in, in Washington, I think more than half the people living with HIV are now approaching 50 or beyond. So it's a, it's a real significant problem. And we work closely with them and they're with us. They talk to us. They listen, we listen to them, they listen to us, and we have a very um, important relationship with the community. And, and um, they're, they're major message to us in the past year is exactly what you're saying, to focus on the health and well-being of persons aging with HIV. And um, we're, we're, I've been seeing a lot of data from the community about issues that are of concern to them. And, um, and, and certainly neurocognitive decline and cardiovascular disease 
and mental health issues are, are three that are mentioned very, very commonly. And I'm curious, my, my colleagues here have great expertise in these areas. I'm um, eager to hear what their, their impressions are. You're on mute, too. Oh, you know, all something right. Thank that you. <laughs> I'm sorry, so I, I, yeah, Renee, sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to just make one point um, because we we talk about, and there's a lot of work at, at the UAB CIFAR on aging with HIV as well. But something that um, has really stayed with me was a, a presentation by Yvette Raphael, uh, who's from South Africa and a tremendous activist and advocate. And uh, a couple of years ago, she made this presentation and you know, we're still on the quest for a cure. And people with HIV, you know, really would love a cure. And I think that's something that our CFARs and the, the collective of laboratories across, you know, the US are, are working on. It's, it's not gonna be one individual or it's a really, you know, it's a big question and a big problem and a very challenging thing. And so that that work is, is also going, it's, it's not, you know, obviously there is nothing that's ready for prime time and implementation, but the, the, the research to get us closer to our cure is a, is a priority for many of the, the CFARs. Great, thank you. Um, and Susan, did you have anything to add on on this? No, like Alan and Renee said, the median age of our population is now 58. And we see that also in our collaborating international countries. It's a wonderful problem to have. But to be honest, uh, we are dealing with dementia, frailty, mental health issues, widowhood, uh, you know, your friends dying, you're alive, loneliness. Um, and also the economic issues of being alone when you're old, it's not cheap to live long. And so all of this are hitting us in many, many ways. I think HIV is the least of all their problems, I can tell you. They're below detectable. They have good CD4 counts. We have six social workers in our clinic of 2,000 patients. Why? Because they're extremely busy looking for shelter, fighting eviction, getting your heating, getting your electricity, you know, making sure that you are not homeless, making sure that you have food. During the COVID pandemic, we spent $110,000 of our clinic money just giving $50 vouchers for food. Uh, up to a maximum of $500 per person because there was no jobs and they were homebound. And uh, the, particularly the elderly who have arthritis, who have hip replacements and everything, it it is really, we look at HIV as a disease, but it is a, it is a person beyond HIV. And sometimes HIV is the least of all their problems. We are just lucky that we have Ryan White and in other countries they have PEPFAR that has given us the opportunity to provide more services than what we could without any of this government support and infrastructure. So it is very important, I think, for us to advocate for all these programs to continue, not forever, because like I said, nothing is forever, but un up to a point, it might vary from one country to the other, from one state to the other, where they can be sustainable on their own, but to pull resources all together at once, I think is a catastrophe. Thank you for that. Um, and I see we're um, coming towards the end of our time now, so I'm not sure if I've got time to, to go to another question here. I, I, I suspect not. Um, I'm receiving the signal that we haven't, but um, 
thank you very much for your contributions there and thank you for your questions and i apologize for any questions that we didn't get a time didn't that we didn't get a chance to get to i'd now like to hand back over to pat hibbert for closing remarks thank you well all i can say is uh, that was an absolutely uh, uh, fantastic uh, presentation and uh, it's uh, very very clear uh, that uh, everybody on the panel and the ambassadors strongly uh, have endorsed uh, the huge impact and power of uh, PEPFAR over the many years. And uh, I've uh, noted uh, the number of lives saved as well as livelihoods saved and uh, now a lot of the uh, challenges are uh, uh, with the, uh, the good challenge is the prolongation of life and where uh, PEPFAR is going. Clearly, I think we all hope that um, there will uh, be continued funding. Uh, and as Susan, as you were saying, if the whole thing is pulled all at once, it, uh, it certainly uh, sounds very destabilizing, but I would like to say a huge thank you to the entire panel and uh, also to the audience for joining and the superb questions asked uh, by the audience. And Peter, thank you so much for your expert uh, moderation of this session. Thank you all. <laughs>